Hi, this is Richard Garfield with The Game Glimpse. Each week, I'm going to bring you a game that I've been thinking about. I'll tell you what interests me in the game, and maybe you'll be motivated to try it. If you've already tried it, maybe it'll give you stuff to think about, or just disagree with. Today, I'm going to talk about a card game called Innovation by Carl Chuddock. Jason Bullman pointed me to this game, for which I thank him. Carl Chuddock is on my, was on my radar because of his game, Glory to Rome, which I hope to do a glimpse on in the future. Innovation is published by Osmati Games, and it's uh, got a, a very attractive, compact box, a little over 100 cards. It plays with two, three, or four. With four people, you probably want to play with teams. Innovation is a game with a motif of civilization advancement through the ages. You begin out in prehistory, uh, the Stone Age, and you acquire higher and higher level technologies until you may make it up to the Information Age, or the game may end before that. There's uh, ten ages in all. The rules of the game are, on the surface of it, fairly simple. Each turn, you can do two actions. You can draw a card from the lowest technology available, or you can meld a card, which means put it into play, or... You can activate a card, use the dogma effect, that is. Each card has a special effect. Or you can acquire an achievement if you have, uh, if the right conditions are met. Uh, There's many different ways you can win the game. You can win by getting a certain number of achievements. That's uh, sort of the alpha way to win. But uh, if the game ends before somebody has had the requisite number of achievements, then the person with the highest score wins. And then there's a whole bunch of technologies which have a you-win clause on it. And so if you get that technology and then you meet the uh, conditions, you can win also. Each technology card has an effect, a dogma, and when you activate it, it'll give you some power. It might attack other players or it might uh, just allow you to draw extra cards or score them or do just uh, uh, often crazy things. Under the right circumstances, other players can either be immune to your attacks or uh, share in the effect. Just like uh, Glory to Rome, the effects are uh, all over the map and very powerful, and uh, so the game becomes about finding cards with exciting possibilities and comboing them with other cards, and, uh, and craziness ensues. It's nice to see a game where the cards are written in English, not as opposed to German or French, but as opposed to some weird mix of icons. I understand the idea of icon-driven cards is to make it so it's easier to translate to a bunch of different languages, but there's a lot of game styles for which this is a limitation, and sometimes it seems like an expensive limitation. If you add enough icons that you get all the variety that a game like this wants, then the game becomes an arcane mix of icons that's uh, hard for people to learn and uh, and and then if you restrict it you might be uh, restricting your game mechanics unduly not every game's cards are looking for this sort of variety there's uh, in fact most games cards uh, uh, having them numbered one through nine in five suits uh, with uh, four special cards or something like that is is perfectly fine but I think a game like Innovation would be significantly worse if the author tried to construct an iconography to communicate all the card effects. As a practical matter for business reasons, using icons extensively does make sense. Uh, it's just that it should be recognized as a cost for certain games. At this stage, I think the market for these games is big enough to support major languages, which it ne- wasn't necessarily 15 years ago, but but still uh, getting it into um, sm- Much smaller markets could be prohibitively expensive. And then you're condemning the players to either struggle along in a language they're not completely familiar with, or have a translated guide, or perhaps stickers, which uh, you put over the card, like with my version of Magical Athlete. I've done all three of these things and find them uh, preferable to learning a lot of icons in the case where I think that's restricting the game unduly. As a pure matter of style... Some people like seeing the games be completely icon-driven for its own sake. Uh, I 
completely disagree with that. An elegant game, which uh, where a few where you, have, where you have a few icons which drive the game, and if it works fine, that that does give me some pleasure. But ones where you fit in tons and tons for the sake of having tons and tons of icons is a uh, is is not not something I'm interested in. For me, I find language much more efficient in those cases. And if it's good enough for Settlers of Catan, it's good enough for me. The card graphics of innovation are straightforward and functional. Simple pictures, uh, mostly it's about conveying information. The way the game effect ties into the flavor of the technologies ranges from pretty good if you use your imagination to uh, sort of inexplicable, at least to me. Some examples of what I'm talking about, I can pretty easily picture what's going on with Fission, where you have a chance of removing all cards from the game, and uh, fermenting, you get to draw a card for every two plants you have showing. With Alchemy, it's pretty cool. You uh, draw and reveal some cards, and uh, if any of them are red, you lose your hand, but otherwise you get a little bonus. So alchemy uh, is kind of explosive, is sort of what I take away from that. Uh, Monotheism attacks other players with different colors melded than you. So monotheism encourages you to meld few colors, which uh, I guess kind of makes sense. But some of the inexplicable ones, like why does a calendar allow you to draw cards if you have less cards in your hand than your score pile? What's going on with skyscrapers where your opponent has to transfer you a card with a clock symbol and then score a bunch of cards and return other cards? Uh, these effects often feel kind of random, uh, but sometimes I, I get an aha, oh, that's what he's trying to do. Or In the end, as you play, the, the technology names become good hooks for remembering what a power is, even if it is unrelated. You learn in time that navigation allows you to steal twos and threes from your opponent's score pile. That doesn't strike me as having anything to do with real navigation, but the fact that it's called navigation makes it take on sort of a flavor of its own, and often I think that's the true value of having a consistent flavor like your cards being technologies. A lot of people are quick to jump to conclusions about games, and I've certainly seen people jump to a lot of conclusions about innovation. But many people, after one play or half a play even, believe you can't catch up if you fall behind, or that it's all about particular cards. This tendency for people to jump to conclusions about a game kind of is one of my pet peeves. I've been playing games extensively for my entire life, and I've designed games and studied games and taught games, and I sit down to a game like this, and I know that I, I can't possibly model all the stuff that's going on. I just have to play it a bunch of times and figure it out. And to see other people jump to conclusions based on their limited game experience, I think is really disrespectful to the author who has actually had a chance to play through and play test all these things. I mean, how can half a play or one play compare to presumably the author's uh, uh, hundreds of hours of play? As I become more familiar with the game, there, we may reach a strategic collapse. That is, our games are dominated by a single strategy uh, perhaps at this point we will recognize that we cannot catch up when we are too far behind. This may be a limitation of the game, and it may be a limitation of our skills. Either way, at that point, the game may become not fun. But even if that's the case, a lot of gameplay is the journey to that point. The end state of chess won't be all that interesting. It'll be like tic-tac-toe, a stalemate every time, or perhaps a win for white every time. But the journey to that point, which we may never get to, is exciting. To carry this analogy of chess further, for me, the players who immediately put down a game like Innovation because they think they see the final strategy are like people who are playing chess the first time and saying, well, white's always going to win because white gets the queen out first and the queen is uh, the most powerful piece. So why should we even bother? In the end, they may or may not be right, but that's not really the point. The point is they're skipping the journey, which is really what it's all about. I've actually personally always felt like I could catch up until very late in the game. That may be my eternal optimism, but it's at least partially because I recognize that the powers in the game are so wild that the balance of power in the game can turn on a dime. You can be way behind and stumble upon some technology, which isn't always even that high-level technology, that is a complete game-changer. Now, that that's something which some other players may not like, which is that the game can change so quickly. A uh, card can come up and just steal a lot of your technologies all at once and, and uh, set you back to the Stone Age, I guess within the context of the game, literally. I don't mind that. I find uh, that sort of swinginess in a game uh, exciting. A game that lasts too long, perhaps, that would be annoying because then if you spend uh, hours and hours 
constructing a situation or pursuing a strategy and then it turns on a dime in the last 15 minutes uh, and then it turns again, you may feel like you're just wasting time. But this is a pretty fast game and uh, I think that it achieves a really breathtaking level of strategy and chaos. And now it's time for the kid's turn. So what's the name of the game we're talking about this week? I forgot. (laughs) What's it called again? Like, really, what's it called? (laughs) I forgot. What's it called? (laughs) (laughs) Innovation. So uh, what does it remind you of? Civilization. Is it really close to civilization? Kind of. Not really, yes. Kind of, I guess. What's your favorite power in the game? It's either fission or combustion, but he also, but he also like physics. You just you just discovered fission, right? What does fission do? Nuke. Boom, boom. I just blow up everything. What about combustion? Combustion, I just get a lot of score from other people. How about physics? It's basically like alchemy. You draw three cards, and if any of them are the same color, then your whole hand blows up, and those guys blow up, and it's like boom, boom, could you... The game we just played was with Skylar's friend, Eli. So, Eli, this was your first time playing. What do you think? It was confusing. Were there any powers that you liked in particular? Yeah, agriculture. What did agriculture do? It sounds much more peaceful than Skylar's choices. It just let me get a lot of score in the early game, and I really liked that. And what what kept you from winning the second time? Combustion. That stopped me from winning. And losing my coal factory. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Game Glimpse. Feel free to leave any comments you have. If you want to suggest any games, you can do that too. Maybe your game will be the next one I glimpse. What's that called? <laughs>